Today we have a special guest, Jaime de, de Miguel uh, from Paddle Galas. Welcome to Paddle Smash Academy. And we are all things paddle. So Paddle Galis is a manufacturing company. We manufacture paddle courts. Um, we are based in Spain, in Valencia. Uh, my role is the business director for America. Right. Now, people always ask me, um, how much is a paddle court? I mean, uh, you know, if I'm going to put it in my home or if I'm going to build a club, they ask me, how much is a paddle court? And I get people think uh, uh, they give me prices from one price to another price. And I think people just don't understand how much the courts cost. Can you kind of talk a little bit about the range of the price per court? Yeah. Um, so it's going to be ballpark numbers. I'm talking specifically about the U.S. Um, you can get a court installed in your, um, in your house for roughly $50,000 all the way to $75,000. Um, all differences would be the type of court that you're building and where you're building your court. Uh, if it's a little bit closer to the ocean, it's going to be easier because the shipment from the ocean to the port, uh, from the port to your place, it's going to be a little bit faster. But if you're in the middle of the U.S., there's going to be added road transportation. But roughly, that's a good ballpark number. Okay, so let's talk about the whole process because I think it's just a lot more than than the price of the court. Yeah. And I think people don't understand all the preparations and all the additional costs that it's going to that you're going to incur when building a, a court. Yeah. So let's let's start from the beginning of actually depend, you know, which court you're going to buy and then then the, the the shipment, the insurance if you need if that included and then the, the you know, transportation from there to the location, right? And then from there um, you know, constructing it. Mm -hmm. So can we Go over that a little bit and kind of some of the costs that, that somebody's going to inquire. My company, we don't do the groundwork. The rest of the uh, of the um, of the process, we can take care of that, uh, but we don't take care of the of the groundwork. Um, that being said, from the time we manufacture the cord, it's going to be roughly two weeks to manufacture a cord, a little bit less. Then it's going to be shipping from uh, international shipping from Valencia all the way to the nearest port where you are. Um, it can take 15 to 30 days, depending on where you are. Then it's going to be the road transportation, clearing customs, things like that. Um, and then it's going to be installed in your house. That process is going to take, yeah, a month, month and a half, more or less. Uh, and that's the, the, the specific of the price would be a cord, just the cord. It's going to be a roughly twenty twenty five thousand dollars $25,000. Then it's going to be shipping, six, seven, ten thousand dollars $10,000, depending on where you're shipping. Then there's going to be installation fees, probably seven, dollars $8,000. And then there's going to be clear customs, import taxes, things like that. So all in all, it's that ballpark number that I gave you before. Okay. So that pretty much includes uh, everything, you know? Yeah. Wow, that's, service. that's great. And how about the the plans? How, how, how do you determine, you know, what footing to put down? Do you guys supply uh, information to the engineer or so that way they can submit to the town? How does that work? Yeah. So normally during the project, we would talk to the general contractor or the architect and we will submit all the documentation, especially uh, the specifics and the specs that we need for the foundation work. Um, if it's a residential project, usually it's much easier because it's just ground uh, one footing uh, that they have to do and we just send them whatever they need to do they will do it and then we come install it if it's a commercial project it's going to be a little bit slower uh, because of permitting so permitting it can take up to two years here in miami i've heard of projects that took up to two years um, and sometimes it's super fast especially if it's a temporary site it's going to be done in a few months so let's talk about the, the temporary site. You just mentioned that. What do you mean temporary site? And, and how, how is that an option for, for uh, private owners or even club owners? Mm -hmm. So this is something that we designed specifically with a uh, well palatory in mind. We have a portable kit where you just install some metal slabs on the side that access counterweight for the court. And you can install that court pretty much anywhere and it's going to be a temporary solution. So the, the way I explain it is we use it for World Paddle Tour because we were going to go install it in an arena that the next day they're going to have to do something else there and we cannot do any permanent damage to the ground. So we installed those metal slabs on the side of the court and we just anchored the whole structure to those metal slabs. Um, that being said, there are people have been using that for a permanent solution, but you don't have to file for permits or permits are a little bit easy. 
because it's removable, it's not permanent, right? Exactly. So that is a great option for somebody uh, as a re in a residential home who wants to try it out but doesn't want to put in a thick slab there and, 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 and if they don't like to have the pedal cords, they don't want to put a pool, they can remove it, right? And it's something that could be permanent, right? Yeah, and it's a solution wow. that we've seen in tennis clubs when they want to uh, adapt a tennis court or an existing tennis court that's not being used that much and they want to install a couple of paddle cords but they're not sure if they want to have it permanent right, right. so they can install the two paddle cords over there test it over three five months and then when they're okay they'll be like okay let's make this permanent we'll remove two more cords we'll install six paddle cords and now we'll do the groundwork so everything can be installed. we're talking about i mean hard cords hard obviously cords. yeah wow so let's talk about now a little bit one very important question is about the turf what are the options? What are the maintenance? What are, how, how does it work? Yeah. Before we go there, of course. Um, what is the cost to that? And is it cheaper than a slab or is it about the same and what benefits? Uh, it's it's going to depend on what type of slab you're going to be building and if it's just one cord of multiple cords. Um, but for uh, just the portable kit, it's roughly 4,000 euros extra on top of the cord. 4,000 4, euros? 4,000 euros, yeah. Gotcha. Um, and then Whatever you're installing, sometimes you're going to install it on top of plywood or you're going to install it on top of plastic, things like that. You would have to add that in. Uh, but if you're just going to install it on top of an existing tennis um, hard true cord, then there's no additional cost. We'll just go and install it on top of that. And the difference between 50 and 70,000, what is it? One is panoramic, not panoramic? What? Yeah, it's depending on the model. So we work with official cords like the Wilson cord that we have. We can talk a little bit about that later on the World, World Paddle Tour Special Edition and the Challenger cords. Those are official cords, um, so they come with additional features, but they also come with different price. All panoramic? All panoramic or even full panoramic with no corner uh, well, What structure. are the major differences between the three? Um, the World Paddle Tour Special Edition, it's the one that you would see on TV, exactly the same, where professionals play. So that comes with a different turf. It comes with Mondo Turf. We'll talk about turf as you ask in a minute. And it comes with protections once you exit the door and uh, for the for the nets. Um, all with official logos. Um, you also might have seen that there's uh, in the, the structure, the corners of the structure have little rackets. Um, that's the, the counterbalance. So that's like very specific things about that code. Then the Challenger, it's also an official code for the Challenger tournament. Um, and it comes with protections. And then the Wilson, it's that partnership that we'll talk uh, a little bit more about that in a minute. Okay, okay. And now, now going back to the, to the... Yeah, the turf. I know some people talk about the Mondo. Mondo is top of the line compared to, you know, monofilament and texturized and all that. Yeah. So um, in the case of galleys, we only work with texturized turf. Um, similar quality to, to Mondo. Um, some people would say it's about branding and they've positioned themselves as a premium um, turf. It's very similar in quality. We use it again professionally for challenger tournaments and that's a turf that we own. So that's normally what we use, but we can work with Mondo and we've used Mondo a lot in the past. Great relationship with them as well. Let me ask one Winwood, which one are you, which are, are you not using a new turf in there? Yeah, which it, one is it, that? it's going to be Texturai and it's the one that we own. So it's okay, what perfect. we call PG5, so Paddle Galleys 5, and that's uh, our own turf. Okay, so now uh, do you use different turfs in different environments or or is it the same turf in all environments? In, in our case, uh, we always use Texturai because it's going to be the best one for, for the weather and it doesn't it doesn't matter what type of climate you're And gonna, so let's talk about the sand or silicone. I always wonder, what is it? Um, is it silicone? Is it sand? And what does it do for the core? Yeah, it is a mixture of both, but it's mostly silicon. Um, it does two things. One of them, it's going to be, it's going to hold the turf in place. So it is around 2,000 kilos, 4,000 pounds of sand or silicon on top that it's going to not allow it to move. It's going to also help uh, when there's contraction of the sand because you're going to have a lot of weight on top. And then it's really important for the bounce. The bounce is not determined by the turf. That's a misconception. People think that the better the turf, the, the better the, um, the bounce, but it's mostly because of the sand. So that's why it's very specific sand that we use. And for a club or even a, a resident or private owner, what are, what are the maintenances that they're going to um, they're gonna need uh, when it comes to owning a, a um, a, what do you call it, a, a paddle, a court? Yeah, it's fairly easy. So normally our recommendation to clubs is that at least they need to sweep the sand once a week. Uh, usually the sand tends to go to the corners. So you're going to have to move the sand all the way to cover the, the whole surface. 
Um, private residence, normally once a month, even two months. It depends on how much it's played. So what does that do? Does that just uh, is brushing and disperse it out evenly? Yes, so the bounce it's spots? even throughout the surface. Yeah. The other thing that it's part of maintenance, but most clubs try to not do or they tend to forget it's right. replacing the sand, uh, which should be something that every three, five months you should do it, six months maybe. Uh, depends again on how much use it gets. If it's super windy, we're in Miami, everything is windy, so the sand tends to leave the court and nobody really places that. So three to five months. So where does it where does the silicone go? Or is it just in the air when the ball bounces, it just goes in the air and just it goes in the air, it goes in your socks, your shoes, uh, it goes <laughs> yeah, everywhere. Definitely. Yeah. And what is the longevity of a paddle court whenever after you install it? Yeah. So for the structure, I, I cannot say permanently, but we've had courts installed 16, 17 years ago that are still there. Uh, obviously a little bit more rusty and now they look old um, but they could last a long time especially if the, the weather is not too bad what you're gonna have to replace is normally the turf um, in a weather like Miami I would say probably every three years it's what I would recommend if it's outdoors if it's indoors it's gonna it's gonna last a little bit longer um, in another environment up to five seven years that's excellent one of the things that we have, one of the issues that we have here that uh, is the, you know, magnifying glass effect where it burns the corners. So what, what will be a good solution for that? It burns the turf of, you know, the corners of the turfs. Yes, um, it, that's a problem that we started to face in other climates. It didn't really happen in Spain that much. So we just started seeing this maybe a year, a year and a half ago. Um, it's caused by um, the, the turf manufacturer will tell you that it's can, it can withstand up to 100 degrees um, Celsius. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, um, but the no 100 degrees Fahrenheit. No Celsius. Celsius. Yeah. Okay. So boiling water temperature. Okay. In Celsius. Oh really? Yeah, that yeah, that yeah. okay. Yeah, um, but the problem is when the sun it hits one spot because of the magnifying glass effect, the temperature that it reaches is over that 100 degrees. Um, and that's just going to be like, if you put anything, it doesn't matter if it's, it is plastic at the end of the day. So if you put any kind of plastic, it is going to burn through that. One of the possible solutions, and it's something that we're discussing right now with Winwood, it's installing a vinyl that it's going to prevent a little bit of the, uh, the, um, right, uh, the rays from the sun to heat directly in one point. Uh, but the problem is it's not completely transparent. So you lose a little bit of visibility, but then the, the turf doesn't burn. So it's up to you to decide whether... Now, are they going to put it in specific places or are they going to do the whole thing? You just need it in the, in the corner pieces. So gotcha. you could install even in like square patches. So they cover that specific part. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not a solution that we have thought about and we have a permanent solution for that. Now, um, if people wanted to try out your quartz, uh, where do you have your what clubs use your, your quartz? So here in Miami, we have Ultra Paddle. Um, in Chicago, we have Paddle Clube. And in Houston, we have a couple of courts at the Woodlands. Um, and then we have a couple of separate And courts. you have Wynwood, 50%. 50%, the most important part, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. It's the turf. It is you the know, turf, that's the where turf, you play. The yeah. turf at Wynwood, it, it, it's going to be Paddle Gallows. Uh, yeah, that should be finished this week uh, in time for the Formula One. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Now, I got to talk about the lights too. You know, I've, I've, I've played at night or, or inside and certain lights really get in my eyes and it, does it have to do with the kelvins or does it have to do with the, the where they put the lights and and how and, and paddle gallus do do they focus on it and and yeah and, uh, is that an issue it's mostly about the positioning of the lights and not the intensity of the light uh that can happen as well and sometimes they use overpowering lights where you just look up and you cannot see anything uh, but normally it's the positioning so yes we work with professional players so for example with the world uh, paddle tour the special edition court we have players tell us specifically specifically where they want the lights and the intensity of those lights um, so it's a, a little bit of engineering work to determine where they should be and what's the intensity the intensity is going to be like um, but yeah it's a work in progress and somebody's always going to complain, especially when they're hitting that smash, yeah. you cannot hit the ball, it's the light. Uh, it right, right, right. And, and, <laughs> and uh, Jaime, let me ask one thing. So what is the, the quartz come with? What are the technical specifications of lights the quartz are coming with? Yes, um, so we work with LED lights. 
um, and they are like for use uh, in the US or all over the world. So it's 120 to 120 volts. I don't know if that's what you're referring to, the yeah. specification of the lights. Well, no, and, and the, 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 what, do you, what do you call the lumens or, or how bright they are? They have different options. We have different options, yes. Yes, so it, it's part of those um, additional um, packages that you can get or, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have a different offering. Um, the again, just talking about the the well power tool, the the, the special edition lights. Um, instead of having just two lights per bulb, this is going to be eight lights, but they're going to be very small eight lights. So in total, it's going to be eight times four, or uh, thirty two thirty two lights per cord. So it's a little bit different. And let me just go and think. So let's say I want to build a core in my house. So what is the? I, I need to uh, build a cement slab, and I need to build. Uh, the electrical aspects, right? Mm -hmm. For me to, for you guys to come and do the core. Yeah. And do you okay. guys, do you guys talk to the engineer to help yeah. them design that? So you can submit to that. To so the we'll tell them where the the light points will be okay. exactly where we're going to need a cable. Okay. Um, we'll do the installation of the lights, and the engineer or the general contractor. The only thing they'll have mm -hmm. to do is connect the cables. That's it. And how about the slab? Will you talk to them uh, about what type of slab um, they need and, and how to angle the water and yeah. all those things? Okay. Yeah, um, we provide the documentation for that. It's usually either an asphalt slab or a concrete slab um, and at 0.5% um, angle yeah, right, for, yeah. for, the, for the drainage of the water. So it's very simple, uh, but usually it's not done well. <laughs> Right. Is that is that what you find? It, it causes a lot of problems. Yes. But why do you, why do you see it not done well? If you're pretty much explaining yeah. it to what your needs are, um, does it cost more to do it that way? Or no. What? It, this is interesting. It's a very common problem that they think zero point five percent it's not enough, and without telling us, they'll go and build two percent just because they think it's going to drain the water a lot faster. And the problem is you cannot install the glasses with the two percent because then the glasses are not going to be in line. And you cannot have one glass touch another. That's when the glass breaks. If a glass is installed properly and they don't touch each other, that that glass is not going to break. That that's that was another question I was going to ask. I've seen a couple of times that you know a player smashes that glass, yeah. and I, I I understand that you know metal and glass can't touch or metal metal. But what other reasons would that smash like that? It's usually poor installation. Poor installation. Um, there's no way, even if you run with all your forces and you two run together against the glass and smash it, you're not going to break that glass. Uh, the problem is, again, not, not a proper installation. Two glass are going to touch each other. And then once it bounces, it's going to touch the other glass. And that's when it smashes. And look, one of the things that uh, is also, I think, very important to talk about is this. I know that when you have the glass, you have the, the not bolts. Yeah with silicone installed, right? Yes. So it works as a, as a you know, suspension thing. Yes. That silicone, and I see it because in, in, in Wynwood, you know, after a few years of wars off, how often do you have to change that? Because when you hit that glass, you heal the glass, you hear the glass hitting the metal, yeah. you know? So, so how often do you change the, that silicone? So for an ultra panoramic code, we suggest that at least it's checked every year. It doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be replaced, but at least go and do a check. Okay. And you can tell us, hey, there is a part where there is a silicon missing or the silicon's getting uh, a little bit thinner here, and then maybe you can replace it. Uh, but again, we've had cords installed for six, seven, ten years where we hadn't to, we didn't have to replace the, the okay. silicon. Okay, so let's say we're going to replace it. So now I have to, you guys have to come back and do it, or we can do that in house. I'd say that's a pretty easy fix. Um, no but you have to take the whole glass out, right? Um, for the bottom and the on the top, there's no silicon. It's okay. uh, it's neoprene. Is that what you call it? Um, the the material, um, neoprene. So I think so. But I've also seen uh, rubber gaskets uh, from the rubber, glass yeah. to the. So yeah, thing. yeah. So rubber. Uh, what I was calling neoprene. Oh, okay. Sorry about yeah. that word. It, it is rubber. Uh, so you're gonna install that goes on the bottom and not the top. Oh. The silicon goes in between the glasses. Okay, I thought it was in the actual when you screw the glass. No, that's okay. always with rubber. Yeah, and that you can replace, but you don't have to unmount the, the glass. It's okay. in between the glass and the metal slab. So you just take it off and replace it. So the silicone wears out like normal silicone does. After yeah. a while, you got to cut it out, and clean sometimes, it out. And then, I mean, you have yeah. a house here and it can be installed right. for 30 years. You're going to be living here and you won't replace it. Gotcha. But sometimes, especially when professional players play, they hit the glass and that can move and that 
you might need replacing that that silicon. And how often do you think they would have to do that, a uh, club owner? Or... Uh, again, we just recommend check every year gotcha. what it looks like. And if it's close to us, we can send somebody. If it's not, just replace the silicon. Uh, you have to try to do a good job and making it look neat. Uh, but it's an easy fix. It's just replacing silicon. And how long does the does the turf last? How, how, what, the, in that maintenance, when do you think they would have to replace uh, the turf? The turf, probably depending on the weather, but it's going to be roughly three to five years. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's indoors, good climate, not a lot of use, seven, eight years, no problem. And what is the cost to that, including labor? Cost is going to be a little bit complicated to calculate, but turf, the turf only, just the materials, is going to be roughly 3,000 euros. And then you're going to have to pay for labor and then the maintenance of the people that are going to come to replace your turf. All in all, seven, eight thousand dollars. Wow. OK. Well, per that, court. Yeah. yeah, that's something that a club owner has to incorporate in their budget. And they have to take into account for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. OK, so let's talk about Wilson and your collaboration with Wilson. Perfect. How does that how does that work? So, yeah, this was it started over a year ago where Wilson approached us um, being um, the world um, the world paddle tool manufacturer and um, one of the biggest in the world uh, because they they were releasing um, collaboration with Bella and we sponsored Bella as well and they were trying to grow their market into paddle so obviously the only way that they can grow the market is there if there's more demand for rackets um, specifically here in the US there's not a lot of place uh, of places where you can play so their, their process of thinking was, we need more courts in order to have more people playing, in order to have more people buying rackets and balls, uh, which made a lot of sense, obviously. So they approached us and they decided, hey, let's design this court together. Uh, Bella also participated in the design of that court. And we manufacture and distribute that court worldwide. The, the goal again is just that we can go to clubs and say, hey, we have this Wilson court. Um, it's a great door opener. Everybody knows the brand in this country, uh, everywhere in the world, but in this country specifically. And they're not that familiar with other brands. So you can go and talk about Bull Paddle or Sioux and people there. The sport is very new in this country, so they won't recognize the brand, but they immediately recognize Wilson. Um, so it's a great way for us to approach clubs and say, hey, we have these these joint venture with uh, with Wilson. They can provide you materials for the pro shop. We can do the courts. Uh, so yeah, it's been an amazing collaboration so, does so it, far. Does it cost more to have a Wilson court? And yeah, so it is a little bit more expensive, but it does come with additional benefits. Okay. So all so in all, you're going to be paying roughly. So the same what are the cost. exact benefits that you have besides obviously the credibility of yeah. Wilson? You know? Yes. Um, so it, it is a great partnership because what they'll do is they'll talk to the club owners and say, hey, tell us what you need. Do you need more rackets? Do you need uh, coaching sessions? Do you need um, materials for your staff? And they will actually provide that. Um, so a lot of support. A, a lot of support, yeah. We're going to organize clinics. If we need to send um, the Wilson team somewhere to test rackets, we can send them specifically to your club because you are using Wilson courts. Um, if Bella is one day here in the US, we can send them to your club and not some other clubs because they don't have Wilson right. courts, things like that. That so may be worth it just in itself. <laughs> it, it opens a lot of doors for the club owner as well. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, yeah, you yeah, are paying a little bit more for the brand, but it gives you a lot of possibilities. Yeah. What are your uh, models or what are your goals when it comes to presence of uh, Paddle Dallas uh, in, in, in the US? Yeah, so our approach has been a little bit different in the last few months. We, we saw that in the market, in this US market, it's very difficult to just do business as usual, where we sell a few cords from Spain, we ship them over to the US, and then that's your problem. You have to provide excellent service in the US, and you don't normally get two second chances. Um, so what we did is we be, we're we building infrastructure here. We're establishing our mm -hmm. company in the, in the US. Uh, I'll personally be moving to the US and what we're doing here is we already have a warehouse in Houston where we hold um, stock. So we have complete courts in stock and we're also going to hold spares. So if a, glass, if a glass breaks or if the turf you need replacing, you're not going to have to wait a month and a half for somebody to send them from Spain. We'll have it here. Um, the second thing is this 
support that I can provide because I'm here. I'm local here. Um, so if you want me to come visit your club in Missouri, I can take a plane and be there and makes it a little bit easier. Time difference, things like that. Um, we will have another warehouse probably in California and another one here in Florida. Uh, that's up in the works, but we should have it by next month. That, that's fantastic. I mean, that, that will be very, very good for uh, reducing the shipping cost the faster you can deliver. I mean, within a few days, you, you will be able to deliver glass, equipment, you know, whatever tools they needed. I think it's a fantastic idea. Let's discuss also about training people here, you know, because that's one of the most important things too. It, it's the builders. Yeah. We, we build it, but we need to be the builders too. Yes. So. so right now, I think that's not a huge issue, but in a year or two years, when there's 200, 300 courts being installed, at a time in the US, that's going to be a big bottleneck. Uh, right now, the way we work is we're sending people over from Spain to install the courts. Um, and that's not a sustainable business model. So yeah. right now, what we're doing is we're trying to train people locally. Uh, the problem with that is right now, there's not enough courts being built for On them to work permanently. Um, but that will change for sure. And the way we work is very simple. We either these people decide to go to Spain so they can see an installation anywhere in Spain or in Europe where we're constructing or even closer. So if I'm building something in Missouri or if I'm building something in Mexico, they can just go there and get certified uh, by watching and installing courts with us. Wait, is there a cost to that? Or? There is no cost. No, they're wow. doing it uh, because they see that there's going to be an increase in, in demand and there's not enough people that are willing to do this. Right now, I think in the US there's three people that can install courts uh, and obviously their prices are whatever they want because they can charge whatever they want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Sounds, oh, sounds exciting. exciting. Where do you see Paddle Galleys growing, going from here in the, in the American market? Yes, so we're trying to focus on clubs and not so much residential because um, residential, the problem is only three or five people at a time can get to see it. Um, so clubs is where the positioning is. Uh, and we're trying to support the club owners um, with everything that we do. There's going to be a few clubs opening up soon all over the US, so that's very exciting. There's going to be projects in San Francisco, in Missouri. Um, there's going to be one in Seattle. There's going to be Chicago, another one. Um, so pretty much all over the world. And I think one of the main important differences here is that the money right now, it comes from, it, it is American money instead of just being people from South America or Spain that decide to invest in this sport. Uh, and I think that switch is very, very important because it, it is bringing the attention of American owners of already. Um, so yeah, that's that's where we want to be, supporting the, the club owners here in the US. So what do you think needs to happen to, to get paddle here in the US, like that push? I know when we had yeah. COVID, uh, we had that push when it came to paddle. What else is needed to... to get this exposure. Yeah, from we just need 3,000 courts installed in the US <laughs> in the next couple of years. Uh, obviously, Palo Cali's courts now, but we just need people to be exposed to the sport, yeah. organizing clinics and just getting people to play. I think one of the main disadvantages here in Miami is that it is a very expensive sport. Not everybody can play it. And even if you can afford to pay uh, what the court is, uh, you're not going to have any spots available. So right. you can only train at 2 to 3 p.m. Uh, that's the only spot, uh, slot available. So so it, what can you tell somebody building a, a club um, uh, what not to overlook? You know. Yes. Um, one of the things that we didn't mention is the, the Chinese, uh, Chinese okay. courts, which is something that when you're building a club and you're taking into account all the costs, you might look into Asian markets and say, hey, this court is half the price of a European court. It cannot be that bad. And then you install it and you see both of them together and it's like, see, it was not that bad. Yeah. It, it looks very similar. And then it's six months later when you discover, okay, um, I just spent so much money on rubbish because it's already rusty. The turf is all gone. So um, they didn't provide any additional sales, uh, sales uh, post-sale service. So obviously it, it comes uh, at a cheaper price, but you get what you pay for. Um, but when deciding to open a club, I think one of the things that it's not overlooked, but they're not paying enough attention here in the US is the importance of having a bar. Uh, in Spain, there was a study that said that the main um, moneymaker in a club is still the bar, uh, wow. more than the rental. Wow. Obviously, Spain is a very different market. I yeah, didn't yeah, play yeah. for 
$10 an hour um, yeah. compared to $100 here in Miami. So the price of the course is that cheap right now to, to, to rent that they needed to find new ventures of making money. So yeah. now there's restaurants and there's additional services uh, that here in the US, obviously also because of permits, it might be a little bit trickier. So other, it's vertical, very other verticals of revenue pretty much. Indeed, right? yes. And I see uh, something that is very interesting because it doesn't exist in Spain, which is the hybrid model of having pickleball and yeah. paddle together. I think that's great. Um, I know you guys have talked about pickleball in the past. Yeah. For me personally, <laughs> I don't love the sport, right. but I think it's a great gateway into paddle. It's Somebody right. that plays pickleball yeah. next to a paddle, uh, paddle court is like, what is that? Yeah. Maybe one day they try, that's it. You're hooked. hooked. You're not going back to pickleball. Yeah, yeah. Sure. exactly. Well, one of the things that they're happening um, here in the country clubs is now they're adding you know, forever they've been always golf and tennis clubs, you know, for the past 40, 50, 60 years. And now they're adding all these extra racket sports like pickleball, like like paddle and all that. And now you're seeing what I call the crossover. You yeah. know what I mean? People now, first of all, the country club, it, it's finding a new way to monetize mm -hmm. the, the, the membership, meaning I can bring in another type of membership, not golf or tennis, now paddle and, and pickleball. And now when you see the pickleball players looking at paddle, now they're crossing over and trying different sports and they're becoming not only just tennis clubs, but rocket clubs. And I think the hybrid model, I think in the first push and the initial move into really the big explosion of paddle, I think it's going to be crucial in the beginning. We had um, a conversation uh, last week, we were in LA and we talked to somebody from the Tennis Federation and they were they were curious about paddle, obviously. They saw what had happened in Europe and they were like, what should be the Tennis Federation approach to paddle? Like, we can embrace it or we can just pretend that it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It's like, I think the best thing that can happen right now for tennis clubs is to embrace paddle. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, I'm not going to say that tennis is a dying sport. You know, I, where I'm at in Connecticut, but, you know, it kind of is. Yeah, and and then, I think they're already doing that in most tennis clubs. They're adapting, they're subleasing, they're changing. I mean, 75% they're subleasing to other things and now it's only 25% tennis. Yes. So they are adjusting and, and, and you know, and changing and pivoting. Yeah. And I think a good pivot would be for, you know, paddle. Yes. They, they were a little bit less hesitant to embrace pickleball, um, maybe because the the installation it's a little bit faster and cheaper yeah um and it's an easier sport and maybe it caters to different audiences uh but with paddle there was always this thing like do we embrace it or not and i think it's like it is the best thing that can happen to your country yeah. club just yeah. install a couple of uh, paddle courts yeah people might play still both but at least now you have a little bit more offering yeah otherwise a paddle club is going to open up in three months next to your tennis club and you're going to lose a lot of you memberships. Membership. They're just going yeah. to go there. That's yeah. right. Guys, if you haven't already, make sure that you hit that subscribe button and turn on your notifications. And remember, it's free 99. It doesn't cost you anything to hit that subscribe button. Thanks for tuning in to Paddle Smash Academy. We hope you'll find our videos informative, helpful in improving your game and learning all things paddle. So until next time, keep improving your game. And remember, learn, play and share.